Hello and uh, welcome everyone to the second in our series of Ask Me Anything webinars hosted by Grassroots for Europe. And the title for this one is Telling the Truth in the Age of Lies. I'm Tamsin Shasha, Vice Chair of Grassroots for Europe. And I'm delighted and also a bit daunted to welcome two great specialists on the subject of truth. Um, they probably know, need no introduction, but I'm going to just add a bit of context. Just before I start, I wanted to say, please, could you use your thumbs up um, on the Q&A to vote for questions you like the most? And we'll come to that after uh, the pres presentations have been made. So, Peter Dukes is an English author, screenwriter, playwright, history critic and blogger. He is the founder and executive editor, alongside Steve Grave of Byline Times, a British political website and newspaper. Since he started Byline Times, the movement has grown and there are now seven other smaller but ever-growing Byline publishers scattered all over the country, including Sussex Bylines, of which I'm very proud to be a contributor. <laughs> you had to get that in there, otherwise I'd never, I'd never live it down. <laughs> Hello to all the Sussex Bylines and the whole Bylines community. I'm so proud to be part of that. Peter, as you may have guessed, is a champion of free speech and independent journalism, so is a perfect guest for this panel. He's also the founder of The Brilliant, and I only just discovered local to me Byline Festival, the tagline of which is dance, discuss, laugh and change the world. I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing right now. Except, well, not possibly at this precise moment, of course. Um, I'm going to quote somebody here now. And it's, the quote is, is Byline Times the only serious investigative newspaper out there? And he's laughing, so he knows he said it. So, um, and that was Mike Goldsworthy, our next guest, who is the co-founder of Scientists for EU and healthy in and a media commentator about the effects of Brexit on the scientific community in the UK. He's also founder of March for Change, advocating the closest possible relationship with our friends and allies in Europe. You probably know Mike from his wonderful lockdown videos, explaining in layman's terms the latest effects of the unfolding saga that is Brexit or updating us on the government's most recent misdemeanors, whether they be dodgy PPE contracts, proroguing Parliament legally, or High Court rulings against them. Highly recommended in the bath with a glass of Prosecco, but that's probably too much information. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> or a cup of tea, wherever you like. Anyway, um, so I'd like to, I was going to ask a question, but maybe, um, should, maybe I'll leave you to just uh, give your introductions. So over to you, Peter. I'm first because I'm merely the warm-up act for Mike Goldsworthy. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you all the Bylines Networks and this amazing group that Mike's brought together. Uh, when we talk about truth, I have to explain that I spent, I know it quite well, because I spent most of my life in fiction. I was a drama writer, a TV writer, a theatre writer for many years. But what this most reminds me of, the Bylines Movement and working with Mike and all of you, is the happiest days of my life in Fringe Theatre in Edinburgh for eight years in a row. And then I subsequently worked for BBC, ITV and American TV companies. And I always remember the days when we weren't trying to fit on a platform, we were building our own platform. And in the autumn of my life, as I like not to think about it, I still think it's springtime, don't let anybody tell you any different. It's so great to be able to build platforms collaboratively. That has been one of the joys of the last five years since I took over byline.com. And this is just another example of that. So just on truth and lies, I, I, I have, I mean, anybody who's read my essays about this Armenian, Welsh, Londoner, who's technically English, because so I think Tamsin, you just called me English, an English blogger, um, is that I... Um, have a very split background. My father was a mad Scientologist and my mother was a scientist and a chemist, and became a social worker. So bring, growing up with those two parents, I had a very acute sense of fantasy and fact, the necessity for fictions, how we need these myths or these meaningful narratives in our lives and the ultimate importance, they do not dominate us. Fact matters, um, it matters whether 
in front of me, it's just a little bit, a glass of champagne or a glass of polonia. It matters. I've actually just written an essay today for a book about the BBC. And, you know, uh, it matters. You know, the BBC promote or encourage flat earthers onto their shows to undermining the basis of their own technology. Broadcast technology would not work if we still thought the earth was flat. Every day in the Thames, I look out and there's the tideway being built. I'm always fascinated. I think Mike is too, by construction and tunneling. That is built on a residue of learned experience, proven, tested experiment, and then reiteration of proof and functionality. Unfortunately, in British journalism, the world I stumbled into in the phone hacking trial, fact is secondary. What matters is polemic opinion. We're run by two punditocrats. Boris Johnson and Michael Gove are technically journalists. I don't think they've actually done a real bit of reporting in their life, but they pontificate and they sway and they bend the public to their reality. And that is what's happened in American broadcast journalism which ended in the insurrection, truth twisted. And unfortunately, we are used to it here with our, our press, who the most hyper-partisan in the world, obviously have a criminal underbelly, is exposed by phone hacking and the Daniel Morgan murder, referenced in Line of Duty the other night. Please do listen to it. But we used to have a good broadcast media, which is rapidly being undermined, both the appointments to senior levels, the BBC, potential chairman of Ofcom, let alone the arrival of GB News and uh, at Fox News here. I'll find, the one thing I'll say about truth, and this is probably my cultural background, I was brought up, and there were journalists who believe this, even journalists I admire, oh, there's no such thing as ultimate truth. Yeah, I'm sure, you're probably right, you're probably right. But also, we can't travel to Polaris but we can navigate by the pole star and have a kind of vague approximation because as Mike tells you, it wobbles and it's all reliant on the axis of the earth, um, that the pole star is generally north. So we always, or by that time, we always get something slightly wrong, it's slightly partial, but our aspiration beyond party affiliation, we're partisan to accuracy, to knowing where that's polonium, to knowing that the world is round. And, I think that has been lost. And I do think Bylines Network is very good on our fundamental principles, separate, separate, separate argument from fact. It's never completely separate, but you can tell that piece is mainly fact. And fact isn't just about science. Fact is legal proof. There are legal facts, which are admissions in court cases. It's not some sort of irreducible scientific concept. It is the concept of the rule of law. And I think as soon as we undermine that concept, not just scientifically, not to, but in terms of the rule of law, did vote leave break guidelines? Are they overspending? Well, they break the law. They broke the law. Oh. Oops, and I broke the computer. The BBC never reported that. They reported they broke guidelines. And that, to me, is where the battle line lies, whether in Europe or not, those enlightenment principles, that there are some truths which are inalienable, and that society can't function without us accepting them. Cool. So to build on that, in terms of the, the spirit of what Peter was saying, and... and and the, the freedom and the sort of fun-lovingness of uh, the Byline Festival in particular does strongly resonate with Grassroots for Europe. And um, I've long admired Grassroots for Europe and everything that um, Mike's hair is alive, just, someone just put in the thread. Yeah, very good. Um, but um, everything that um, uh, Richard and uh, others like, uh, like Colin have, have been uh, building up um is really really important to maintain um and uh so part of what we wanted to do with the bylines network or my in initial conception was i loved what byline times were doing um we just lost a general election the last thing that the grassroots needed was uh sort of getting stuck in a rut um or being told by one large organization okay now 
go and do everything our way or go and do everything our way when there were so many ideas um, brimming in the grassroots and there always have been how do you build a platform to keep on empowering those local grassroots groups and and for me it was kind of like each and every person that, that wants their say should be offered you know a channel to be able to get those voices out and to communicate with their communities but also to talk about national level things from the vantage of their community and so that's why um, I sought Peter out in January 2020 um, and said um, I've got a, an idea which is um, there's tons of local groups around the country um, they need to be given another layer of ability to communicate beyond just the Twitter accounts and, and Facebook groups. They need to sort of bed into their local communities. And I know local journalism um, is, is a thing that can really resonate with, with local communities and really open up channels for, you know, individual people who want to get stuck in. And we've got, you know, a wealth of that from what I understood in our community. And he said, well, Mike, it just so happens that uh, the people who provide our website at Byline Times have made this white label version, which we were thinking about for, I don't know, other matters like, it, you know, subject matters. But yeah, I guess you could do it regionally. Where, where would you start? And so it kind of went from there. And we did start with Yorkshire, but now we've got Sussex, absolutely brilliant one, Tam Tamsin, yep. <laughs> and also um, Kent and West Country bylines, West England bylines, and North East bylines, and Yorkshire bylines. And we used to have East Midlands, but we don't anymore because it's combined with West Midlands to become central bylines now. Um, and so it really is a very lively um, network. And I'm very pleased to say that for this month alone, across the bylines network, we are just under half a million reads or half a million visits to the website. So if everyone this evening before it hits midnight could, you know, hunt through, um, you know, what's been coming out of those and give it a push, you know, half a million in a month is pretty damn good. That's like over 15,000 a day reading it. 15,000 being the audience capacity of, um, uh, center court right so if you can imagine that number of people reading just bylines network stuff okay um each and every day weekends included throughout the month that's the kind of rate that we're going at at the moment and that's our community expressing themselves and as i was trying to give this a push today because i was like right 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 we could do this half a million thing i've just added up the numbers across yorkshire and west country and west england and sussex and so forth and so on um i was like there are some pieces here that are just really good. And at the beginning, it was, I thought, yeah, okay, you know, this, this is this is right, this is getting there. There's some quite nice pieces in. But that piece about um uh, 11 cabinet uh, ministers have broken the ministerial code quite clearly. Here's who they are, here's a picture of them, here's what they said, here's exactly why it breaks the ministerial code. That took off like like wild, wildfire last time I looked had 65,000 reads on it. Um, the one put out today um, by I think uh, Central Bylines on um, Serco is not going away and you should know about them because um, they misled the NHS 242 or 252 times and so had ca contracts cancelled on them. And they were found guilty of defrauding our Ministry of Justice and also they tried to cover up scandals that they had in, in uh, making immigrants uh, or asylum seekers uh, work for one pound um, uh, an hour. Um, and yet our government still continues to hire them. You know, I didn't know that about Serco, but you know, there it is from one of our networks. You know, there's another one um, that I just uh, brought back today, which was out in January, which is the policing bill, um, not only criminalizes protests and criminalizes sort of gypsies and travelers, but also just for anyone trespassing as per ramblers climbing across um, fields or, or going up mountains, that can now be criminalized. So we're going from a culture which is European when you can walk everywhere and basically you're not, if, if you trespass, that's fine as long as you're not doing any damage or, or you know, breaking any other laws to one where it's American style shotgun, get off my land because I'll have a right to shoot you kind of stuff. 
So I wasn't aware of that, but that these are the kind of things that we're putting out, even some of the initial PPE investigations into why we're using contracts without tendering and how our rates compared to rates on the continent and it's way up there that was something that we got out early and then that was cited in letters from i think rachel reeves so to have that kind of impact um is absolutely fantastic and as um and it's the kind of empowerment that i really want us sort of march for change and the bylines network to be behind and also working alongside peter and all of his initiatives is just so much fun. But then also, and this is the final point, that just like Peter was saying, um, the timidity of the BBC has really gotten under my skin so much now that, that um, I will quite openly and regularly slag them off. Uh, for an organization that size that has all the resources to do proper you know, investigation based up, deep dives, go off the beaten track and educate people about things that matter or really hold our government to account. They're just not. And they're timid of calling a lie a lie. And they are indistinct from Sky or, or, or ITV um, in, in terms of doing anything. And then those other mainstream channels as well, including some of the main newspapers, again, aren't doing um, those refreshing, you know, side takes and in investigatory work that we all associate with true traditional spiritual, right, you know, right minded uh, journalism uh, for the sake of, of, of really building that truth. And that's what I see in Byline Times. And I and, you know, it's it's brilliant when um, uh, what they've been doing and the recognition that they've been doing. And I'm very proud of the fact that the byline networks under you know, the great stewardship of Louise uh, Houghton is really very much in the same vibe and the same mold. And then that channels all of you guys out there, you know, your writing, your ideas, your thoughts, your community, your capacity to build, you know, it is there is, is your tool. And, you know, I've, I've spent more money now hiring experts in, in uh, digital setup, SEO, discoverability, so that it's, you know, more likely to come up there in the search engines. It's being listed in Google News um, and, you know, adding up all the, um, all the other technical bits and pieces onto it so that it really is cutting edge and it gets maximum expression so that's that's what we're busy doing right now great thank you mike um i'm certainly very in uh, very grateful to be part of the bylines uh network and um i think we need it as much as we we need it to grow as much as as as, as it as it is because to fight uh, Fox News and uh, to fight the equivalent of Fox News, GB News, and um, the the Murdoch Empire. So you know, bring it on. Let's have them in every corner <laughs> of the globe, really, um, because uh, you know the, the the war on on truth is is so full on at the moment. So um, let's continue to grow it. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions now. These are some questions that we had um, by email to either of you, both of you. We are seeing increasingly totalitarian measures, a few recent examples being curbing protests, scrapping official TV, and the attempt to, um, to cripple judicial review. How much further down this path with measures we have not seen yet do you believe this government intends to go? Uh, Peter, do you want to have a go at this one? Yeah, I think this is more complicated than we think. This is the high watermark of, you could call them the outright or the libertarian right, which isn't at all libertarian, that supports Boris Johnson. This is two years, coming to two years into their administration. And that's when you do all the changes. I've, those who remember Thatcher, especially in her second term, realised that that's the moment, you know, you kind of you know, you, you get your marks and then you have about in that middle period, you can do all the changes you want. The interesting thing, to be really honest, and it's a very scary time, it's scarier than Thatcher's in many ways, but it is incompetent. If you look at the, even the policing bill, the policing court sentencing bill, that isn't even going to committee yet. The other moves like this ridiculous commission report, the free speech champion, the waving the flags, none of these 
really anything except tokenistic culture wars. They're very disturbing, especially if you're a person of color or someone who thinks that patriotism is different from nationalism and you shouldn't sort of, you know, and if you're a refugee here in this country. But I am in mixed mind of whether, it's obviously the, the, the thin end, the wedge of totalitarianism. Uh, and, and we had a piece, you know, turning national folklore or selective folklore into something you must obey, like you must obey with this free speech czar. That is, you know, culture is a choice. Uh, you know, your the, the particular myths about the British fam, royal family, however you want to believe in. We had God Save the Queen coming out of the Sex Pistols the same year as the Golden Jubilee. You're allowed to leave both things. This government doesn't seem to want to do that. But is that their agenda? I am still confused. I'm still an open mind about that. They might just be a kleptocracy. I, what matters is the money that goes to, you know, the three billion we've tracked now from the PPE and emergency contracts to conservative donors or to conservative associates. That probably matters more to them than flag waving. And it's actually a completely different principle, isn't it? Because this is money, as is one, Johnson's his pension for pension, I should say in French, uh, for Russian oligarchs. These people exfiltrate their money overseas. They're not actually nationalists. So I think we're in a very mixed time, just to conclude, it's kind of a rump trumpocracy. We're very isolated, not only isolated from the EU, but Joe Biden does not like Boris Johnson. He does not like breaches of the Good Friday Agreement. We won't have a trade deal with them. And we are marginalized in a way that Thatcher never was. Thatcher, ridiculous war in some ways, but Thatcher won the Falklands War. She was part of the program with Reagan to defeat Gorbachev, to defeat Soviet Union. We are completely irrelevant. And I think there's a comic aspect, a lot of showmanship out front, while round the back, they grab the swag. I, I like what Peter said just now with regard to Thatcher. I think that's very interesting because she, of course, was a driving force behind the single market. She was right at the heart of it. And then over on the other side of the Atlantic, she was dancing with Ronald Reagan and Ronald Reagan was musing, isn't she wonderful? So, um, you know, um, despite her record at home, she also had that solidity of, of, of place in the world, whereas Boris Johnson is what is left when Trump has departed, um, as far as the Western world can see. And not only did he get a particularly bad Brexit deal, a stunningly bad deal, um, but this country is in the mad place whereby our mainstream media uh, presented it as a stunning win, but that's not how it's seen around the world. And so as a country, we have been quite detached from the, the global view on what we are. And anyone who taps into that global view um, is kind of seen as a traitor to the country. I mean, I, I agree with, with Peter that there's a huge amount of incompetence here. I mean, I know that Boris Johnson knows that he surrounded himself with patsies and was slightly worried about it at the time. Um, but what we're looking at is, is also in terms of policies, there was an idea and there were originally some well-laid plans, but pandemic and knee-jerk reactions have sort of thrown all of that off course. And what you've got is, is um, a never-ending series of short-termism from this government. And because they've made so many U-turns so far, it's, it's less of a determined government about what they're doing and more of a fly-a-kite government, which means they're absolutely inviting us to bash them on the policing bill, which, as Peter rightly pointed out, they immediately um, booted the committee stage into the long grass because they got spooked, just as they got spooked about you know, free school meals, just they got spooked about you know, immigrants working in the NHS and their rights. So I think there's a massive opportunity for us here to turn up the heat on the government and actually stop them uh, going, uh, you know, uh, full distance on a lot of the things that they just sort of like fly around 
in, in some of their bills. There's, there's real opportunity to skewer them. And this opportunity comes from the left and the right, Brexiteers and, and, and Remainers. And that's what we really need to tap into now. So I, I saw some questions in the comment thread, you know, how do we get it, the C2DE demographic? How do we get to, to soft leavers? And things like the policing bill, um, as you know, with March for Change, we, we co-signed a letter with Richard Tights, ex-chair of um, the, the Brexit party and, and now, you know, leader of Reform UK. He is appalled by um, the government waste on PPE and the fact that he knows various people that have got mansions out of this. He is appalled by the policing bill and what that would mean in terms of shutting down parliamentary protest and other protest because the Conservative Party have tried to shut down his stuff before. Um, but then um, also Dominic Grieve wrote a joint letter with um, Steve Baker uh, to, to the same effect as well. And they're worried about where the government is going in terms of overall authoritarianism versus their innate liberalism. And it's starting to, to pull at them. And then the article that I told you about before, um, which was about um, criminalizing sort of trespassing and ramblers, you know, that's brought out um, countryside interest groups, right? So this is a big soft underbelly for the Conservative vote. If we can get that out to the Shire uh, Tories, the, the, the Shire sort of Conservatives, then, you know, that's another thing whereby they're hosting themselves by their own petard and they don't really see it coming and are likely to, to U-turn on. So I do think that everything that they're toying with is actually very, very scary. But I do think that um, they're doing it in such a haphazard and incompetent way that if we've got our smarts about us, um, we can carry on making them U-turn on tons and tons of things just by public pressure, because they are a populist government and public pressure spooks them. So uh, that's where, you know, everything about what we're doing um, really fits in. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that kind of leads quite nicely into the next question, which is about protesting. Um, and when when do you think we'll be able to march and what effect will that that have? Um, do you think someone is asking, perhaps we could do something, actually, this is Martin Connell, uh, perhaps we could do something when the world's press is in Glasgow for the Environment Summit for uh, COP26. Um, yeah, that's obviously we'll be marching before then, I think. But do you think um, do you think that there is a capacity, uh, a desire for people to march now, uh, actually to protest against this government and the way they've handled both COVID apart from the, the vaccination rollout? Um, do, do you think that is going to um, ignite the public or do you think people just want it to go away? And just because because we've, they've masked so much um, under under COVID that uh, people just want to get out and fly their kites or whatever <laughs> you know the, U the the uk flag or well, the union jack or what's your um, yeah i i can speak to that i mean at march for change we have inherited the <clears throat> public liability insurance that britain for europe had before um and that was what was used by the people's vote campaign for all of the people's vote marches, except actually the very last one, which was done by a slightly different mechanism. So we've been thinking about that a lot because we have that capacity to have that, you know, official public liability insurance. We've got that experience from doing demonstrations before that are signed off by, you know, the local authorities and police. Um, I think there is appetite for that. Um, and I think it's been good that in the interim between the last People's Vote March, um, there have been, you know, a whole variety of other protests from Black Lives uh, Matters uh, through to um, more recent ones about the policing bill that you've seen come from both the left wing and the sort of lockdown sceptics. And I think that if you if you pick your targets right, as in, you know, the right places and under the right uh, placards, then there is there is definitely plenty of opportunities for that. I think there seems to be growing appetite in the country for protests, you know, and peaceful protests. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's there's plenty of opportunities there. But you always have to be super careful 
with the optics because you always have to focus on what is publicly acceptable. Uh, and this is where Extinction Rebellion um, have sometimes um, got the rest of us in trouble. Um, and so, yeah. What's your feeling about Steve Bray's, um, the protests in uh, June, uh, the um, Five Days, Ten Cities protests, and what do you think that message should be? That's, that's tricky uh, for me because I don't know what it's going to look like. I think if it's, you know, over, you know, if it's, European flag sort of waving, then people might just think this is, you know, the Remainers and they're sort of dying off slowly. I think it should actually find local issues that um, people are angry about, you know, whether it's um, local policing, uh, local maintenance, um, dog theft, and, and issues like that, um, or, or businesses closing down because of Brexit and think about a, a, a local spin on it that then opens it up to a, a wider audience. I mean, when we did the Save British Farming protests, for example, like that was beautifully organised by local pro-EU groups mm. with pulling in those farmers that wanted to do the tractor thing. Um, and in which case it was about this government selling farming and British food down the river and, and selling it off to Trump but it was the organizational capacity of the local pro-EU groups that really made it work and, and pulled together. Um, but we have people in our team who come from, you know, quite Brexity backgrounds who said, that's totally acceptable to, to all of like my family who voted Brexit. They, you know, they love that kind of stuff. So, find, so finding the new terms well, on that as to how this government is letting down local communities by not helping the fishermen, not helping local businesses who are trying to export their food, you know, the, the farmers, the, the, the cheese makers, et cetera, et cetera, is probably um, the best way to do it. Und, under this notion of, you know, 100 days of Brexit and look how we've been stuffed kind mm. of thing. Yeah. That's, I, I think that's the kind of vibe that, that would cut through. OK, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Peter. Well, actually, I actually had to fur this stuff on activism to Mike. Not that I, you know, Byline Festival gives platform to a lot of activists, including March for Change, Extinction Rebellion, various Muslim groups. But I think my role, um, apart from my own personal preferences and what marches I go on, or my role as a citizen, I'm, got a, I, I'm a lead claimant in a class action against Facebook. When it comes to Byline Times, we are there in a slightly different mole with writers from the Green Party, left and right of Labour, Lib Dems, to Peter Oborn, former Conservative, to give the information to make those political choices for activism. And, and I think that's why it works very well, a very diverse group like the Bylands Networks. I really don't understand. I understand the public liability insurance because of festivals and filming a TV crew. I don't understand the dynamics of organising activism. I, I deeply approve it. This is an act of citizenship, just like being a citizen journalist or you know, getting good information to make those informed political choices. But it's quite important for the identity of Byline Times that we don't recommend voting for any political party, obviously, since we don't like lying and transparency, kleptocracy and uh, opacity of funding. We're not great fans of the current Conservative Party, but our role is not our role is to bring you information for you to then go march with it. Sure. OK, thank you, Peter. I'm going to ask um, a question, final question that we had by email, and then I think uh, we will open it up. Um, so this is comes from one of our council members, actually, Hanya Orsulik. Uh, according to the BBC Royal Charter, the corporation's public purpose is, and I quote, to provide impartial news and information to help people understand and engage with the world around them. The BBC is failing to fulfill this purpose. It is failing to challenge leave supporting MPs on bogus claims, failing to scrutinize government policy and failing to raise public awareness of the real impacts of Brexit on the lives of the British people. How can grassroots groups make a cut through to the public when we're up against such powerful forces 
of the British media. Is there a case um, for holding the BBC to account for its failure to fulfill its core purpose? How can this be done? I think, Mike, you've already mentioned something on this. So do you want to pick up on this first? Um, yeah. So I think that um, we should all be well versed in BBC complaints. Um, it's, um, you know, if you see something, say it. Um, you can you can email them or you can leave a message if you're going to leave a message, sort of uh, write it down, you, you know, an audio message, write it down first and, and rehearse it, make sure it's like 60 seconds. And then when you call through, you sound like you know exactly what you're talking about rather than, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say um, that you shouldn't, oh, I'm talking about the programme that, you know, script it and then say it. I think constantly um, going at BBC complaints about that, I think it's useful. But then I think the absolute best way um, is always to uh, show how it's done. Um, like if you've got an idea in your head about the way you want to see news working and, and looking or radio sounding is to, you know, get involved with what we're doing. Or, or if you can't get involved, then, you know, support it with, you know, subscriptions or, or sharing on social media. Um, but... I think we, even if you've got a small voice that is doing it the right way and the way that you want to see, then that's something that you can always point to because the BBC's defence is always this. Yeah, people complain about us from both the left and the right. And that goes to prove that we are neither left nor right. We're mm -hmm. just in the middle with the crazies from both sides attacking us. It proves that we're doing a perfect job. Um, whereas that's not the case because... Um, is that my main complaint with them is that given all their resources, the quality is shite um, in terms of depth of analysis, in terms of being able to go slightly sort of like off piece from what today's churn is and do a big informative dig that, that, that's well presented. The exception to that is, is Ross Atkins, whose videos do extremely well on Twitter because he is dry, he is crisp, what he presents is well researched and in just a few minutes, he is exactly what, you know, you always expected the BBC would be. But then, you know, you, you watch it going on in a lot of the conversation programmes and it, it's, it's talking heads about, you know, the, the, um, the ephemeral issues of today without, it doesn't feel like any deep anchoring. So essentially, um, it's a constant case of um, pointing out what you don't like, um, but also contrasting it with what you do like. And so what we should do, particularly with, with uh, Ross, um, who, um, you know, I, I chat with in DMs incidentally because um, he's, he's, he's a really cool guy. And so just, just keep boosting what he's doing and keep saying about what he's doing. This is what I want the BBC to be like. This is what I want the BBC to be like. Because he's in the tent and if they see that he's getting love and that's uh, what goes down well with an audience, that's, that's a very strong nudge. So yeah, support what we're doing at Bylines Network, support Open Democracy as well. They do some great uh, investigations and stuff. Dsmog Blog is another one. And then within the BBC, uh, uh, Ross, and then, you know, just, just keep pointing it out. This is what we like, this, this is good, this is quality, this is what we think journalism's about, and feel very free to outright pan the BBC. And you can say, um, I love, you know, the BBC per se, but BBC News has really gone down. BBC News, I don't trust it anymore. BBC News is superficial. BBC News is just pandas to the government. Yeah, so we, we, so it's up to us. It's up to us really as much as, as anything to, to use our, um, our, we've got a fantastic platform and byline. So, you know, write, write to the BBC and, and get out there and do that. I think that's a great idea. Um, Peter? Yeah, it's such... Difficult one. I've worked for the BBC, God, since 1984, on and off. And the mother of my kids, very senior um, editor there, first woman editor of Newsnight. It's always been small C conservative, culturally um, liberal, if you like, just because the art artists are. But when it comes to news, small C conservative. And I've had beefs with it back to the Bosnian War over various issues. And here it's in a lose lose, because basically what is happening, 
the cuckoo is in the nest. I would say Andrew Neil was the first cuckoo. As edited of the Sunday Times, he spent his entire time, he had a whole correspondent, I think his name was Jonathan Miller, not to be confused with the famous theatre director, who every week on the Sunday Times had a story about the BBC, how bad the BBC was. Then the Mail had also a BBC uh, correspondent. And basically what's happened is partly thanks to outsourcing, a lot of corruption, I would say, I call it corruption, no names mentioned, but a lot of the sort of undermining the BBC came from independent companies coming in, making a lot of money, a kind of revolving door between commissioning editors and production companies, they get big contracts. And there's money on them, their hills. And I think, you know, the appointment of Richard Sharp as chair, Tim Davey as the, whatever the chairman of the other director general, proves that from Dominic Cummings' point of view, a key ideologue for no longer in the government, the BBC he designated as the mortal enemy in 2004 at his first Frontier Freedom Foundation or whatever his think tank was. At the same time, Daniel Hanna, his great friend and colleague, was designating the NHS as a mistake that made people iller. Now, the odd thing is the BBC actually forms an alliance from the shires to those who go to the proms, who like the archers, to those who believe in public service broadcasting and the more radical kind. For 50, well, for 100 years almost, but its first 20 years were contentious, I can tell you. Didn't cover the general strike in, 19, in the 1920s. The BBC has kind of brought Britain together as a cultural institution. And it is falling apart, and that's partly technologically, because the others, you know, Barry's Byline TV would start off with a few thousand in the studio and have the same kit for broadcast stage, which cost hundreds of thousands a few years ago. And also because this country is falling apart mm. under what it considers its cultural institutions to be. So my problem is we do this all the time. We cover with ex-BBC journalists the failures of the BBC to cover, for example, the revelations that Jennifer Curry did have an affair with Boris Johnson, according to her. And that's not about his private life, it's that she got lots of money from and recommendations from him as mayor of London. Prima facie investigative case, the BBC didn't cover it. The Emily Maitlis did do something about Cameron last night, Newsnight. So there are different forces in the BBC. But those who hate the BBC, defund the BBC, entering it and destroying it from the app, it's a win-win. They take it over, everybody hates it and it destroys it or they attack it and don't take it over and that destroys it. It's a very careful line we have to tread. And the way I do it is where it went wrong for me was the emphasis on due impartiality or rather became radical impartiality by the way in 2005, six under a certain head of news. But they saw their job because they're on attack from the right, the license fees, you know, poor people pay much bigger proportion of their income than wealthy people, that their job was to reflect the opinions of the nation, mm. which isn't their remit. It's, they're not a Vox Pop organization. They're there to inform and entertain it. Most students might like to think that, oh, maybe Muslims are invading Europe and going to replace white people, but that isn't taught on the curriculum in the university. Meanwhile, climate change denialists are given, you know, the two sides argument on, on the Today program. They have lost that mission. And the mission wasn't to reflect, it's not a mirror, it's a lamp. It should be illuminating, not some grotesque reflection upon reflection of what some people in Rotherham think or what some people in Islington think. And that fundamental, and I think it goes through culture. I think people like Mike, Mike are great sort of rescuing it from us. This loss of trust in the idea of information, of truth, that it could be conceivable. And it becomes this radical sampling of what the latest crazy things until since 2010, I think this is right, I'm not sure, they've had no pro your MEP on question time and Nigel Farage 34 times. I know, I was just about to say that. I was just about to say, I wasn't sure how many times, but I know he was- I may be wrong about size figures, mere culpa. Mm, you got there first. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm gonna open up to, we've got lots of questions here um, in our Q&A. Jonathan, you, you yeah, are- Yeah, I'm, I mean, Big fan of David Allen Green. You know what he's been blogging on. How do you get people to care about the constant lies? If they don't care, are they really lying? And how do you actually get people to be accountable? That requires people to care. 
can I answer this one? Because this one I constantly face, have done for, you know, probably since the phone hacking trial, but certainly since the Brexit vote when I went with Kat Carroll on, you know, Cambridge Analytica and the, the vote leave wrongdoing through the league. And the, one of the great Russian information tactics, which has embedded itself in the UK public, doesn't matter, nothing will change. You know, and now I get, oh, but start, still up in the polls. It's like truth only matters if other people recognize it. And actually, the principles of free speech, which everybody on the outright keeps on talking about, are not that, yeah, I should be able to be able to go around and offend people of color. It was that the one guy in the world might have the right idea and everybody else is wrong. But unless we allowed him or her to speak and analyze this idea, we'd never know, you know, Mendel or Eisenstein or somebody with some far out principles which turn out to be true. And I think this idea of the populist imagination, that it's a common sense, common sense, you know, ad populum argument that it only matters. We should just ignore that. And where, where it really matters, my final answer to this, you cannot live on lies. You can't fly a plane on a fiction. You can't drill a tunnel on a fiction. You can't do brain surgery just because you happen to work for the Brexit party. It will matter. And we've just got to be ready for that moment when the British people are disillusioned, when they realise they've actually had one of the worst pandemics in the world. When they realise this Brexit deal is awful, they've lost a lot of rights and they're poor. They will realise that. And that's when we patiently step in and say, no, it isn't the problem with immigrants because they're not coming anymore. It isn't the EU commission. It isn't some foreigner. You, we were lied to. And I'm so, and we've seen this, Mike's seen it. We've done these great films of Bala TV with the fishing industry. And you don't go, yeah, you were wrong. I told you. You go, I'm sorry the information out there was so you know, deceptive. I'm sorry you were deluded, you know, buyer's remorse but they must, we must kind of forgive them and look for the solutions. That's, you know, and it, the lies will not sustain. And the worst example of this is a great book by Hafner, I was just reading, Sebastian Hafner about living through 1930s Germany. The thing is, I mean, much worse than it. I mean, there's no comparison, by the way, but there's elements of this lie. It all collapsed. I mean, 100 million dead later, it's unsustainable. Great answer. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Mike. Yeah, I've, I've got a very simple psychology answer to this, and it's about what we're doing wrong. Um, and that is, here's the lies, and here's the caring, right? And we bang on about the lies, hoping that it draws in the caring. Whereas what we have to do is we have to go to what people care about, understand what they care about, and then draw in how the government's lies impact upon that. That's the right way around because, I mean, who in their right mind out there on the street is suddenly gonna take a lecture from me if they don't know me from Adam, if they don't know who I am. But as soon as you establish that someone is, you know, a community leader there or, or a nurse or a doctor, someone highly respected, someone who's got their back, who has fundamentally got their back in society? A lot of people thought Nigel Farage had their back. The fishing community thought Nigel Farage had their back. That's um, why they would listen to him when he said, you know, that other people were lying and so forth and so on. So you've got to do the hard work of going to where they are with your knowledge sort of in your side bag and then say, right, so when it comes to farming here, or when it comes to your local industry, or when it comes to the funding that your local council has, you know, that means this and that for you. Did you know this, mate? And then people go, oh, right. So that's that's what you've got to do. And we keep, we need to say that again and again, don't we? Because, um, you know, uh, Nigel Farage, if you go onto YouTube, as I did once, and I unfortunately pressed on his fame and fortune thing that he's got, going his hedge fund thing now every time I go on to YouTube the fame and fortune or is it fame and fortune I think it is some kind of hedge funding thing and I'm like you know is this is this is what it was all about all, all the lies that he was telling those fishermen who've lost their businesses um so that you know this he's gone on to something else forgotten about you um okay so he'll be in Dover when immigrants wash up on the beach complaining or whatever he's going to be doing next which is horrible but you know that's 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 the truth of it, 
And so we keep ne needing to almost, re you know, re 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 referring to that and um, uh, well, the horrors of those, those kind of people. Um, I digress, but um, thank you. I'll go on to the next question. Okay, uh, yes, I've been hearing about the lie stuff. And in fact, uh, my grandparents were brainwashed by the Daily Mail and as a, result, as a result voted to leave the European Union, although my grandmother uh, regrets um, her vote. At least I think she regrets her vote. But anyway, um, because people uh, cheated and told lies during the referendum campaign, what do you think should be done if we are to send a warning to future generations? Things move so fast. There's so much. We live in an information economy where, so fifty percent, I might correct me, of the economy of value is created through processing information. Obviously, not the kind of we do on bylines and byline times. But so, therefore, all the money, you know, it's not profitable journalists at the moment. But big hedge funds like. The Gartam and Waste Marshall, Paul Marshall's has run investing in GB News, see it as a way of controlling the economic landscape as well as the political landscape. So information is actually much more valuable than it ever was and is the, you know, information warfare is the front line of what we're doing. So it matters more than it ever did with less money, <laughs> uh, unless you've got a hedge fund. And but let's be clear, journalism until 1850, until the independent model of the Times funded by advertising, it was always the plaything of rich men, and usually rich men, you know, not women. That is going back to a norm of 150 years ago. It's setting, there's still a historical record. You know, there's a great Italian phrase, I worked on a musical 10, 15 years of Mrs. Gucci, which is based on now to be a film, not much, unfortunately, my script, uh, of the Gucci family, and there's a great Italian expression, truth is the daughter of time. Our Academic institutions still work, our scientists still work. I laying down the record as you're doing in the regional bylines with great investigations, also great voices. You know, journalism isn't just finding facts, it's also a true representation, a true representation of the real opinion of the British people. Um, that will matter, just as mass observation did in the war. All the myths about the war and East End being very happy with bombing, exposed by mass observation. It's amazing. Um, public-spirited project to record people's real experiences of wartime Britain. So I just say, message in a bottle. Set down what you think. Set down what you're seeing. Tell the truth. Tell your neighbour. Change one mind. You know, that might matter. You know, I've heard many stories. We have many, like Peter Ober, disaffected, regretting leavers. Welcome them in. And, you know, we are fact hungry in the end animals we do need to know what are parasites where's shelter where's water what habitation works and i they say the arc of history is long this won't last this won't last i like that line i love truth is the daughter uh, of, um is the daughter of time it's a lovely line um I think the hashtag tell the truth is one of the ones I do the most in, in bylines, just fact checker, tell the truth. It's just when your life is so full, you're surrounded by so many lies, it's so important to keep reminding people of that. Mike? Well, I wish mother and daughter would hurry up a bit. <laughs> um, but yes, um, I agree with the, the essence of what, uh, Peter was saying there that essentially um, truth and uh, accurate records fit together naturally and build strong structures that, that can be tested and hold up, whereas lies pile on top of each other in a very haphazard way and can make temporary structures, but they tend to fall over with time. Um, and after, you know, maybe a few years, it's hard to see the difference between the two structures. But if you keep on plugging away with that sense of integrity, it's the difference between a, a skyscraper and something that's toppling over all, all over the place. And, and as more time goes on, you see it more clearly. And this is essentially the, the task of um, uh, the, the pursuers of truth, those who are interested in, in Wissenschaft, you know, whether it be history or whether it be science, it's that accurate documentation of the way things really are. 
Um, so it is a case of just um, trust the system and, and, and keep building on it. I think um, to, to uh, you know, the warning for future generations, which was the essence of the question, I, for me is twofold. One, um, we must never let this go. Um, in that you can't say, oh, well, you know, like, let's say we go back into the, you know, EU or whatever after years of slog. And so it's all good. No, I mean, this this particular period of time with Johnson behaving as he is, uh, we have to make sure goes down in history as when the absolute um, selfish clown uh, brought down all of the British systems, the deeply British systems that we held so dear. And we will keep banging on with that narrative until our dying days. And, and make sure our children do the same, because that is important. Um, and then the other part of it is, is should we ever have uh, referendums again or other elections coming up, everything that we see that has been done, which is dodgy, we demand that the parts of democracy that we're engaging in have the right structures. Why have the right structures? Because look at the referendum of 2016, um, which, which wasn't uh, safeguarded in all the right ways, the terms weren't set out clearly. There were no mechanisms of accountability in it. It was dominated by um, white male politicians of both political parties there, rather than the whole representation of all the different industries, uh, you know, talking and freed of that, you know, it got it wrong, wrong, wrong. So there are two parts to this. One is, you know, like a bulldog, we have our teeth in this. And for the rest of our lives, this is our, this is our message about this period in time. And then secondly, um, for, for all democratic events going forward, we make demands on quality, uh, citing, you know, the, this, you know, uh, particularly the referendum as to, you know, what happens when it goes wrong. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, we've got a lot of questions to um, get through. So I'm going to ask the next person, uh, Rachel Ashley. Hello. Can you hear Fire me? Away. Yes, we can, Rachel. Fire away. Um, well, well, I've asked um, several questions, but the first one that got the most votes was, how do we reach the C2DE demographic? We've not managed to reach them so far, and I don't know how to. Any ideas? Peter? Um, I've, I've got a, to jump in quickly, I've got a, a couple sort of by, uh, by means of example. Um, with Brexit, you should be aware that the C2D demographic uh, voted remain um, up to a certain age. And then after that certain age, the C2D demographic was wildly pro-Brexit. Always remember that because otherwise you, you, we, we, we trick ourselves about that. Mike, can you just explain in the chat what the c to D2 demographic is. Oh, right, okay. So it's, ba it's basically um, wealthier classes versus working classes. So your, your bands are um, A, uh, B, C, D, E, but they tend to get bundled together in, in A, B, C, 1 and C, 2, D, E in order to split the population into the, the top half of... Um, uh, wealth and opportunity and, and, and job type, and then the bottom half. And so what you actually saw in the Brexit vote was overall um, the ABC1 demographic voted remain and the C2DE demographic voted leave. And so it was a case of, aha, that goes to show that the working class wanted Brexit, whereas the poshos wanted to remain. Whereas actually the, the age trend was a lot stronger. Um, and so what you found was, that for the youth, um, C2DE voted by a 10% margin to remain, whereas, uh, you know, in the older category, it was wildly pro-leave. And in the 65 pluses, their ABC1, they voted leave. So um, the, 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 the posh, well-heeled retirees voted leave. Um, but, but examples of um, what matters to the C2D demographic now, there's unfortunately a little bit of bunkering in of that demographic into Brexit. I think it's even got slightly stronger that they see it as a bit of an identity thing for the working class, which is a real problem. But there are things such as uh, the farming issues and um, 
kind of protecting British farming uh, from being raided by sort of Donald Trump and uh, or or dropping quality standards that resonate very strongly with the C2D class. Also, um, at March for Change, we we launched recently um, a campaign for a COVID Memorial Day backed by British Medical Association, uh, Royal College of Nursing, uh, Nazawit, uh, the Teachers Union, um, and others, uh, and some celebs. And YouGov did some polling on that because that was was in the news. And even though by a slight majority, more people didn't want uh, a COVID Memorial Day, it can still be nudged on it, the C2D class uh, did. I mean, they preferred it much more than the, the upper class because, we're, and we're guessing here, is that for those that are more sort of like better off, you know, they've been working at home, they're, they're less likely to be on the front line. They've seen fewer disasters. They just want to get back on with life. But for those that have, you know, been more in the community, been uh, sort of suffering more, being hit more, kind of want that acknowledged more. That's, that's our guess. But that's the way it goes. But I think with, with a lot of cultural issues coming up, I think it is interesting to do polling on that. If you want to do your own polling, incidentally, um, whether on an individual level or by group, I highly recommend um, uh, uh, Google um, surveys. If you look up Google surveys, you can actually spend some money asking a polling question. Like, say, for example, if you want a representative sample of 2,000 people on um, a single question that will cost you about 160 quid, I think. Um, mm. 1,000 is about 80. But, I mean, you can actually go and, and poll some of those issues yourselves. And these are representative. And basically, the questions will pop up on lots of local newspapers. You know, when you go to a local newspaper and sometimes you have to answer a question in, in order to get in, that's yeah. often, you know, put up by Google surveys. Very useful tool. We, we've used it a lot to sound out lots of different um, issues. But I think just having a mind on what are the sort of like broader cultural issues that, that, that seem to be resonating in that group um, is really interesting one to go for. So it's, it's the right question to ask, yes. Thank you, Mike. Peter, did you want to add anything for that one? Because yeah. Just very, very shortly, uh, just that um, uh, the other factor of the age uh, which was a key, you know, if you looked at these remain leave, is region or actually nationality. So I think um, Anthony Barnett, his book, The Law of Greatness, points out, I think it's Motherwell and Wigan, post-industrial landscapes, almost identical demographics in terms of economics, even, even age profile. One voted by large amount remain and one voted by large amount leave. And I don't need to tell you where they, which of those two towns, one in Scotland, one in, the, in England, voted which way. The only thing I'd add to that is we're always transected. One of the things about being British, I was like the great, great phrase of George Bernard Shaw, who's Irish, of course, all it takes for one Englishman to open his mouth for another Englishman to hate him. I'm actually, I spent my teens in a council estate, but I'm going to Cambridge, I'm identified as a certain class, and that is parlayed and played metropolitan elites, GB News or Andrew Neil, they're supposed to be, you know, fighting against. They'll play region, they'll play class, they'll play age against each other. That's classic colonial divide and rule. Brexit was that, if you look at the way they appealed all their dark heads, all these different demographics, the Le Believe campaign, Michelle Massani and Tom Harwood on GB News, contemplating the metropolitan LGBT crowd, they will do that to divide and rule and promise everything to everybody and this is just back to this thing about lies you cannot deliver to everybody if you're promising that and the final thing i'd say about this especially this revelation over class constant discussion about ctde all through the eight years and the labor's lost millions everything that the last four years have revealed to be wrong with this country whether it's the rule of law accountability of ministers the bbc the electoral commission was already wrong, was already weak, was already prone to anybody walking. And Dominic Cummings and Donald, uh, Ronald, Ronald Johnson, Boris Johnson, just walked through those norms because they were never any real safeguards. And I would say, when it comes to class and all these issues, this is a gift in a way 
to be shown what was wrong with this country and fix it in the long term, as Mike was talking about the last question. Thank you, Peter. Fascinating. Um, every time you said C2D2, I was thinking of R2D2. It's because I've got a nine-year-old son, so I do apologise, but he's obsessed with Star Wars. So uh, there you go. Um, I'm going Very healthy to... obsession. <laughs> I'm going to ask another question. Oh, well, I'm going to actually. We've got um, is it Martin? Martin next. You want to yes. ask a question, Martin? Thank you. Uh, so I'll be quick. Uh, what are your three most useful ways of vetting the source of your news? Um, who wants to go first? I, I think Peter probably alone should tackle that because I don't vet the. Um, okay. Yeah, Peter. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Good journalist, well-trained, who knows how to double source things or go to comment, that's the key thing, which separates journalism from comment is that you say you delve out something and you go to the person you're talking about for comment. I don't think Boris Johnson ever went to the subjects of his spectator articles for comment. He just made, you know, disparaging remarks about LGBTs or people of color. Um, and, and in a way, you know, when we've some uh, revelation about PPE or some dark money group going uh, or right wing activist group doing something nefarious, right? The way I check it, the way or hedge fund is how they respond. When you go to, what well, we think you've been doing this, blah, blah, blah. And from their response. So in a way, your first fact check is <laughs> what is the news about? Who is it? And a good journalist will always do that. Um, we work a lot with, I was a citizen journalist. I had no journalistic training till the phone hacking trial, you know, whatever, seven years ago. So one of the other things I, I, you know, I learned apart from going to comment is, you know, just being really careful about what you could stand up. And I think the amazing thing about the Bylines Network is that people get that, you know, you really get it. Maybe because people have been, you know, if you've been on fairly targeted news, not only you've got to go to them for comment. Being fair isn't just about fake balance like the BBC does it, you know, flat earth and mound earth. It's maybe you got this wrong. A certain element of scepticism about your findings, especially if we, I worked with the help, I gave Bellingcat their name. I worked a lot with them. The open, the open source is very good, but you can make false inferences. And there are so many connective tissues between different groups. Everybody... QAnon phenomenon is based on this idea we all are in research, we all go down this rabbit hole and discover this pizza parlor may have had pedof you know, a paedophile vein working there and be in the basement. Of course, they weren't, didn't have a basement. And maybe somebody had fact checked whether they had a basement or not, would have sold somebody turning up with a, 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 an assault rifle. It's, there's no one way, but imagine it from different points of view. And uh, people are important, but also really uh, open source documents, government replies, court documents, all those give you the security. But the best security you have about anything is if you get something wrong, it's still in the public interest. I, this is about something really important, not about the sex life of some you know, celebrity, public money is being sent, potential cr criminality. And there's no guide to, that's the best guide. Is it worth pursuing this, even though I get something wrong? Because legally, you have a public interest defense. And, and I'd look at the law. Those were my three rules about bylines network. I'm just using this as a little training manual for all you great bylines writers. The three defenses are truth, the most difficult, by the way. Nobody wants a truth defense because the level of proof you need in a libel trial for truth is pretty bloody daunting. Public interest, as I said, it may be wrong, but sufficiently, in, sufficiently up there that even as long as worth raising the question is, why did Aaron Banks lie about being the Russians? Now, nobody's saying, you know, I certainly never said he got any money off the Russians, but it's still public interest to ask why he did conceal those multiple visits to the Russian embassy. And then your third defense is of opinion. You just go, you know, if you're writing an opinion and argument piece, I think it's really wrong the X and Y. I just, you know, I feel it's wrong for my bones. You know, and that's where your free speech in the classic terms locks in. Those are your three defenses in, in defamation law. And I, you know, I, as writers and journalists, I look to that whenever you check your sources. So that's truth, public intent and opinion. The interest. Interest. And it's not called opinion anymore. It is called 
honest opinion. That's right. Honest. Honest yeah. opinion. I, I really do think that that guy, Simon Dolan, who tried to sue me for saying I thought he was trying to intimidate BBC journalists. I really do think that. And I put the cause of that. I mean, biffed away his legal complaint. Uh, because, you know, there was Prima Fasche was saying to this BBC journalist who's covering disinformation around the pandemic, well, if you didn't write that, you wouldn't get these people threatening you. I thought that's intimidatory. That's honest opinion. I wasn't saying, oh, I think something fake. You know, it was an honest opinion, which I generally uh, put forward and had the basis for that opinion in the, what he'd said. Great. Thank you, Peter. Brilliant. I'm going to move on because I know we've only got 15 minutes left officially on our, on our time and we've got lots of questions. Um, Hanya, next, do you want to um, ask your question? Yes, thanks. Um, it has partially been answered, but um, I want to ask if, if bylines is the solution to lies in the media, then how do we get people to read it? How do we expand its readership? Um, I mean, most people do get their information from the BBC, from ITV, from the Daily Mail. So we need to, if, if bylines is the solution, we need to get the cut through with bylines. Good question. Um, who would like to answer that? I'll happily answer that. Well, of course, it's not a small task, um, but what is happening right now in terms of the media scene, it's very, very interesting. There's lots of different entities setting up their own sort of TV studios and, um, um, and so forth and so on, because fundamentally, we all now get our news via social media, or increasingly we do. Um, I, in fact, did a Google survey just on this and asked people where they get their news from. And um, the, the majority is um, either BBC TV um, or social media. And they're kind of like neck and neck, but, but social media is ahead until you get into the oldest category with uh, radio and print press um, and from family and friends all, you know, a lot lower. So the interesting thing is when you've got so many people using social media as their interface to news, um, then one article is just as acceptable as another. I mean, this was one of the reasons for setting up the Bylines Network. You know, why read a Guardian piece on something or an independent piece on something when you can read a, um, a West Country Bylines piece, right? Um, if, if it has fundamentally the same kind of quality of content you know which is letting you know what's going on with some facts and figures you know we we can do the same thing so the so even though you know the bbc is still dominant um it is all changing rapidly you know this is also why gb news people are starting to realize that it's all more fractious and it's all more community based there's a lot more market segmentation and there's lots of broad accessibility through social media so what we want to do first is, you know, establish, you know, Byline Times, Byline TV, Bylines Networks is the sort of um, throbbing news heart for, you know, our community and beyond all those that, you know, beyond the leave and remain argument, um, that then also reaching others who are like minded on some of the other fronts and then we want to have capacity in order for the, the bylines network, the, the local things, to actually reach locally and do events locally and push posts locally and, um, and, and engage, you know, with, with local businesses and, and local activities um, more and more and more. So that's the model. It does take time, but we are growing extremely fast. Um, I've, I've been delighted with how it's it gone and um the way that you can help is just to you know help any way you can i mean whether that's the subscriptions or donations or writing yourself or sharing on social media or when if you want to organize events as part of your thing then writing an article about those events or you, you know it can all interact it can all interact and and that's meant to be uh the beauty of it in that um you can either support it for what it is, or you can, you know, find your voice through it. That's that's the design of it. So yeah, it's just a case of, you know, if you see what it's about, then uh, get involved. 
you think it's worth going to cities when we're allowed that have uh, that aren't really represented by bylines and perhaps you know um draw yeah getting awareness of of, of the network handing out hard copies um well not necessarily but just having having conversations uh, with people maybe having a kind of um not a demo but a, a stall or something on the street or trying to yeah i'm just trying to think when we're, when we're allowed to actually get out there physically and uh maybe it's a com- com- connected to something else that's happening nationwide i mean for me i i do think wouldn't it be nice to have um like hard copies of, of just a few articles and sort of like a teaser you know I have that have a look through that yeah, and, you know, yeah. That things are informative and, and by the way you know um here's here's the um website it's interesting because uh we have a little little magazine which I live in Brighton so it's called the Brightonian it used to be called Queen's Park News but they merged and actually, I found myself because I couldn't listen to the BBC for a while because it's just not, because I've been listening so many years to Radio 4 that it's just I just uh, didn't enjoy it, especially when it was just Brexit all the time. But this little kind of local Brightonian magazine, which is just local news and local stuff, which is very innocuous, not political in a way, was the one thing that kind of gave me, which was kind of slightly comforting. But that kind of thing, I, you know, yeah. hard copy one that is... Does, does it feel more wholesome? Yeah, somehow. On, well, yeah, that's, that's it, it, is, isn't it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Uh, Peter. I really haven't got much more to add than Mike said, but just two things I noticed somebody is saying, why don't we have a collective byline site? And that isn't the planning, you know, that we'll have all a little map of the UK and you'll have, I don't know, byline investigates, byline TV, byline time somewhere, and you can click and find out where your bylines is in a sense of, you know, let's sort of c- collate some of these groups. And if you any of you are interested in producing a print edition, it's not that expensive. I mean, the expensive thing for us is mailing it out. Um, so the cost of 12,000 we print is less than a thousand pounds. Mailing it out is well in excess of that. So um, it, it may be worth your while. Design, that's a bit of an issue. But I do think physical things help. And I do think that events help. Maybe, we'll, and also obviously when Byline Festival comes back, you know, we'll have the Byline stalls. Maybe we'll just have the Byline's line dance to, to start it all and competition between the, the various groups who've got the best dancers. Um, but yeah, any way of spreading the word like that and and making it fun and engaging people. Yeah, because I do remember um, during the um, before before we were completely out of the EU, um, Mr. Weatherspoon's uh, magazine coming through the door and feeling outraged. It would be nice if we had the Sussex bylines arriving on the door, you know, local one, your local bylines with all that positive news and truth in it. Um, we've got time for some one or two more questions. And with uh, the positive news, like I've said before, positive news about Europe and about what Europe is doing and European culture and, you know, green initiatives that they're doing, rewilding initiatives they're doing, quality transportation, you know, all that kind of like grass is greener kind of stuff yeah. that, that helps, you know, subtly reaffirm that kind of British European identity. Which is what we'll be doing with our Festival yeah. of Europe. So we'll have lots to report on uh, when, when that happens uh, next year, hopefully, or nearer, nearer um, sooner than that, I hope. Uh, Andy, Andy, would you want to ask your question? Are you there? Yes, yeah. Thanks, right. Tamsin. Thanks, Tamsin. Um, how does one easily identify truth in the manipulated mess of circle style lies, uh, particularly when people have such short attention spans and therefore providing truth as a news source like uh, bylines or a, a Facebook blogger? If the motivations to lie are delivering such rewards in votes and power, what is to stop the lies and their attempts to discredit sources like bylines as nothing more than Guido forks for the other side as it becomes more and more successful. I think the the primary thing here is that yeah you can engage in lying and you can engage in anger yourself but you're not going to keep going for very long if you do that because you'll just burn out your own soul. 
Um, and certainly for me, coming from science into campaigning, I was struck just like how much I was, you know, checking and double checking myself to make sure everything was was right. Whereas what I was up against was just people saying anything they like just to set houses on fires and move on so that the Remain campaign had to go and douse it with water. I think a, a lot of um, all that fervour around Brexit is burning itself out. Um, you don't see so much full throttle angry defence that you used to see during 2015, 2016, 2017, all the way through to 2019. Um, I think it, it largely has burnt itself out. So it's just about um, doing, doing the right thing, double checking yourself, um, making sure that it's quality. And usually you'll find, you know, the sense check of it is, um, is this something that I think I could show to like a Brexiteer? And they would say, yeah, fair enough, fair point on that. That's the test, right? Because you know, you know when you write something or you know when you claim something, whether you're being, you know, over alarmist and making a push or whether what you're saying has been a little bit more thought through, is a little bit more respectful, is a little bit more earthy and deserves a little bit more kudos. You know that difference. That, that difference inherently. And I think as long as we keep with that, um, then especially under neutral titles like, you know, um, byline, uh, Sussex bylines or West England bylines, and then that is just going to be more acceptable to people that we need to reach before we, you know, fully wrap them in the flag and bring them into our community and you know, <laughs> charge them off. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Peter, just want to... Yeah, just quick, because I, I sense we're still running out of time. So there's a living test experiment for me, which is out of the Brexit um, ambit, which was this time last year when I was ill with COVID, and actually March the 12th, and Robert Peston wrote about herd immunity. And I, mean, not, I wasn't alone, but I was one of the first to pick up. Hold on, you mean 60% of the population gets affected, infected? ITU rates, especially when, you know, uh, hospitals collapse, that means maybe, you know, 250,000 people dead with a novel virus, which you don't know its serology, and herd immunity has never been used without a vaccine in 50 years as a public health policy used in, you know, better than a year. It doesn't take long to look up that herd immunity spiked after that Peston article had not been mentioned ever, hardly ever in terms of the coronavirus, look on Google Trends. And then look back in the medical literature to find it was only ever really used ever since the 1930s with a vaccine of a stable virus like the rubiola virus, virus responsible for uh, measles. And what we knew about coronavirus is that they rapidly mutate. And any so, you know, there are some fundamental, I'm not a scientific expert, but I got to that quite quickly, quicker than Dominic Cummings or Valance or Halpern in the government did. They hadn't thought it through, which is amazing. Absolutely amazing, because it was convenient. Sometimes the thing that most warn you that this is an untruth is it's too convenient to what you want to believe. Like, for an example, and we had to constantly correct that. Mel on something tried to do a hit job on Byland Times about the expenditure of eye, eyes and lashes by the Home Office, not by Priti Patel, and it did provide PPP, PPE. But people wanted to believe Priti Patel spent 77,000 pounds on her eyebrows and it went viral and people screenshotted our, our article, actually said, but this company does PPE. So just be wary of something that Dominic Cummings isn't all bad. He probably was arguing with Rishi. Sinek about the second lockdown and realized how devastating the failure of a circuit breaker in late September was. You know, just be careful that voice that goes, oh, this has got to be true, because it probably ain't. So we all need to pause, I think, sometimes before we retweet or like perhaps. Just take a breath. That's probably quite a good thing. You always um, think that your mother is watching. Pardon? <laughs> Always think that your mother is watching. Oh, Yours God, is. <laughs> Brilliant. On that note, I think that's a great note. Um, I think we're just on time here now. We haven't, we've run out of time for any more questions, but that was a brilliant debate. And I think this one will run and run. So we'll be probably back soon <laughs> asking you again for other opinions. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we'll be back in April, which well, is April tomorrow, but sometime in the middle of April. Not sure who we've got speaking yet. Uh, do you know, uh, Richard? 
Not confirmed. The, the in limbo people, uh, Elena Romigi, uh, I don't know if that's confirmed yet, but that will probably be in three weeks tonight. In the meantime, we've got our usual open forum next Wednesday at 7.30 uh, on the usual link. Uh, if anyone isn't in touch, John now said, how do I get into, oh, well, if anyone needs to get in touch or be put on the mailing list, please email me, richard at grassrootsforeurope.org and uh, you will be informed about all of our future webinars and open forums. And, uh, and thanks uh, ever so much for having us on and full kudos to everything that you're doing with Grassroots for Europe and always keeping things alive and responsive and pushing out new initiatives and hosting things like this. It, it really keeps, you know, a lot of life and creativity going.